my wife and I, Alison, uh, we had a holiday on the Dart estuary. And one day, because of, and the clue is on the wall behind me, because of my obsession with kingfishers, we found ourselves on the Harborn River, uh, which leads to Bow Creek, which is part of the Dart estuary. And we just seen a kingfisher and we walked a bit further along the river to see if we could quietly perch uh, on actually uh, uh, a slipway to see if we could see it again. Well, um, thankfully we did, we did see it. Suddenly Alison realized he was looking the kingfisher in the face as it perched amongst the foliage just across from the river. And, uh, and then something spooked it uh, and off it went. As we sat there, still being patient, uh, a man came round the bend on this very narrow bit of river full of shrubs and trees, standing on the river. And as he came round the corner, um, we, we obviously looked really surprised to see this man standing on the river, as you do. And um, uh, we began this conversation as he stood there on the river. His head was brushing the low trees and shrubs, and he looked quite incongruous uh, as he stood there. And we had a conversation with him. Uh, you've guessed by now that he was on a stand-up paddleboard, and that's why he was successfully managing to uh, be in that position on the river. But as we had that conversation, um, there was something deeply profound about the way he listened. So we were interested in him because he came from the local area. And, uh, but there was something about the quality of his attentiveness. Uh, he wasn't just a professional reflective listener. Have you ever experienced that, I wonder? Someone who just the sheer quality of the way that they're with you. And uh, he did that. And um, we nicknamed him afterwards the Angel of Bow Creek because uh, we felt so heard, and indeed, I think I'd want to say we felt so loved. Um, it, it reminds me, thinking back of it, of a, something I came across recently from David Augsburger, and he says this, being listened to is so close to being loved that most people can't tell the difference. <laughs> being listened to is so close to being loved that most people cannot tell the difference. Well, that's all very well, but what about if no one seems to be listening? What about if there doesn't seem to be anyone alongside us? What about when we feel all alone and it's hard going and the boat is getting swamped and the wind is rising and the waves are increasing in size? What about when, as we join the situation in Matthew 14, we've had an overwhelming of overwhelming. Do you use that phrase at all? Perhaps you've experienced that this year, an overwhelming of overwhelming. And um, for uh, those that we're told about in this passage here, there's been the death of John the Baptist that's led Jesus to want to have some time alone to reflect and pray. His cousin the person that perhaps he, above everyone and everything, he connected with best. Of course, John the Baptist's death was a shock to at least some of the disciples as well, because they'd originally followed him. <laughs> and in any case, it signalled that actually this venture that they joined Jesus on was fraught with danger and difficulty. And then, of course, as they seek to try and find some reflective space, as they try to get away, they find themselves overwhelmed by the crowd that pursues them and wants more of Jesus's teaching and his healing ministry. And then we get to the stage where um, the disciples are aware that um, they need some food and they say, send them away, Lord. I don't know if you ever feel like that. I'm sure you never feel like that about the people you serve. Send them away, Lord. <laughs> I ain't got anything more to give. <laughs> but I think probably most of us get to that stage at some point. Send them away, Lord. Uh, and Jesus says, so you don't need to send them away to get something to eat. Uh, you give them something to eat. Well, <laughs> if you want to be overwhelmed, uh, to have your space squeezed when you're trying to reflect and um, uh, debrief, uh, uh, to find then that Jesus says, you give them something to eat, that's pretty overwhelming, isn't it? 
there's no professional that you can sort of offload it onto to take charge of that bit. Well, we know what happens next, which is that um, uh, the 5,000 or so are fed, and then Jesus sends the disciples away while he finally gets the time and space that he needs, presumably to continue to reflect and to pray and to spend time with Father alone. The sort of space actually that some of us were trying to achieve yesterday when Beth gave us that holding space uh, yesterday morning. Jesus sends them away. And um, this time they're in the boat on their own. Do you remember there, Matthew 8, there was the other story of the boat that was um, being overwhelmed. Jesus was pretty chilled in the boat. Um, and then they have to cry out to him, don't you care that we drown? And Jesus steps in. This time there is no Jesus. But there is an awareness of the fact that they are in the boat and what's going on. Well, we'll come to that in a moment, but I just wanted to acknowledge at the moment the feeling of overwhelmed and vulnerable and being all alone at sea, which they have to live with and that we have to live with. And the feeling of being out of control. I wonder if you've had that sense over the last several months. This is just that so out of control, feeling powerless as well as overwhelmed. Someone said that there are a number of ways that we respond when we feel out of control. One is that we deny it by pretending it's not happening. So we do what I'm doing now, which is we smile a lot. Uh, we mask it. We even say and do the right things. And there is a place for that, of course, at times. But we fake it as well. Denial. Perhaps you've done a bit of that from time to time. A second thing that we sometimes do is we escape into some sort of um, addiction. We eat too much, we drink too much, uh, we binge watch something or other. Um, uh, some sort of addiction. Some of them can have some health-giving properties, lots of running or whatever, walking, but others are not so healthy to us. The third thing that people do is that they... Um, find themselves getting very angry and aggressive and violent. And uh, what goes with that is the desire to blame someone else uh, or to scapegoat someone else. And um, that, of course, does happen in our churches, doesn't it? And uh, we get caught up in that. Sometimes we're part of it because of the rise in anxiety and feeling out of control. And then there's another thing that we sometimes do, which is we, we reduce things to very, very simple explanations and say, well, it's all just this, what's going on around us, or it's all just that. And we avoid the fact that there's, there's a whole complexity that's going on. Uh, our world doesn't like complexity. It always wants there to be a simple, straightforward answer. And uh, if you don't see it my way, then watch out. The fifth thing that sometimes we do is we... Um, we go into overdrive to be omnicompetent. Now, uh, you may think, think, actually, I've got no temptation to do that, but we can want to appear to be omnicompetent. <laughs> um, you know, there is a Messiah and it's not you, it's easy to say, but actually, in practice, we, we all have a go at uh, wanting to look omnicompetent. And the language of world beating is all part of that um, shoring up isn't, isn't it of the fact we really do know what we're doing and what's going on there is a sixth and final thing which is the despair and just sheer disappointed living that we settle for with hope evading and evaporation and uh, David Ford who writes about an overwhelming of overwhelming and also writes about the depression he experienced as a result talked about the biggest lesson he learned was that he wasn't in control and couldn't be. He needed to be able to acknowledge that. And um, uh, as scary as it was, that was absolutely vital for him to do. So sometimes you can preach this passage by saying, actually, the thing is, we're all supposed to walk on water. And, you, you know, if you want to walk on water, get out of the boat and all that. Well, that is one way to preach it. But it seems to me that this passage is talking about, in a different perspective, 
the sheer concern and interest of Jesus, who uh, leaves the mountain, uh, whatever we make of it, journeys across uh, the lake towards the disciples who are already struggling against a strong wind. And um, in Matthew's version, uh, he doesn't make to pass by. He actually goes to them directly and actually encourages them and uh, says uh, to them, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Jesus is not um, oblivious to what's been happening for you and for me. And I need to say he's not oblivious to what's been happening to your church either. Sometimes people say that the word, the, the boat in Matthew's gospel particularly represents the church. And I quite like that. This story is not all about Simon Peter. <laughs> it's about everyone in the boat. Does that make sense? It's not just about him and about having great faith. So Jesus comes near, take heart as his eye, do not be afraid. And um, Peter, of course. He wants to get across the few steps that perhaps there are between him and Jesus. And he says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. Well, there's no paddleboard and you'd be a fool to use a paddleboard in those conditions anyway. So he's going to have to actually take a step out of the boat onto the water, which is already intimidating. Well, you'll have made the point about the fact that what he does almost immediately that he gets out of the boat is he finds himself looking at the overwhelming of overwhelming, which is the wave and the sea. And uh, it's easy to make the point, oh, well, he needed to look at Jesus. But actually, this was, you know, this was a massive thing and venture that he was stepping out into and onto. He starts walking towards Jesus, and then he noticed the strong wind became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Perhaps that was the point of the whole thing whether it be John the Baptist who's died, whether it be you give them to some, something to eat and realise you can't, but you, you can give something towards it, whether it be being in the boat and uh, feeling Jesus' uh, absence, uh, the whole point is learning how to be out of control and learning how it is and how important it is to reach out to Jesus himself. Lord, save me. Lord, rescue me. It's a raw cry, isn't it? Perhaps it's the raw cry that we allow to be in our hearts and on our lips again today as we come to break bread together and drink wine together in a moment. It's the raw cry of knowing that we cannot save our church. We don't know what's the other side for us and our church. And when I say the other side, we all, need, we all know now that it's about getting through that tunnel that Beth talked about yesterday. It's about being in that new situation beyond lockdown. We don't know what it means, what it'll involve. Being the other side, we don't know. So we have to say now, and we'll need to keep on saying, Lord, save us. Lord, rescue us. Lord, take us through it. And of course, that's the very thing that we're told in this passage, Jesus does do. They do get to the other side. As the wind dies down, as Jesus steps in to be with them in the boat and uh, uh, challenges their faith somewhat. You have little faith, why did you doubt? And of course, the, the doubting is not, can I walk on the water? Please don't go away from this talk today thinking. The main thing is I've got to have more faith uh, in order to do spectacular pyrotechnics uh, and impress everybody and show how much faith I've got. That isn't the point of this passage at all. The point is that in this situation, it ends up with the disciples saying, and truly you are the son of God as they worship him. It ends up affirming again, I am not. I have not got enough if I've got something that Jesus takes. But together with Jesus, there will be and is enough to take us through to the other side and to what we need to do and to discern next as a church and as individuals. Truly, you are the son of God. So actually, the whole point of this passage is that Jesus is the great catcher. 
It's great, isn't it? <laughs> He's the catcher. Not the person that's actually trying to get us to perform certain tricks on water. Frankly, if that was the whole point of the passage, then the Apostle Paul had a lot to learn. Because he seemed to get into trouble in boats and on water rather a lot. And at no point are we told he actually thought he should have had more faith to walk on the water, just to give some perspective. <laughs> Henry Nowen, uh love for um, the Rodley's aerial stunts, the circus trapeze artists, that he had time to uh, spend, uh, 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 spend some of their performances and talk to them about what they, what they did and how they did it. And um, uh, the leader of their, of their troop explained to Henry that their actions have to be precise and each person has got a specific role to play. So in the aerial routine, the flyer lets go of the bar on the swing and, as you'll have seen yourself probably, flies to the catcher whose legs are wrapped around the bar of the other swing. And um, Henry was told this, as a flyer, I must have complete trust in my catcher. And so although all the applause goes to the flyer, actually it's the catcher who's the real star. It's the catcher who's the real star. So we come afresh to Jesus, the catcher, as we think, as we've done our best to be faithful. He reaches out his hand to catch us and to help us to get to the other side. May that be true for you in your overwhelming of overwhelmings, in the times when you most sense you're sinking, you're going under. May it be true that you find him to be the one who, as you reach out, catches you, holds you, takes you and those that you're responsible for and that you love to the other side. Amen.